Hey everyone, welcome to a special coaching carousel edition of the Dana Joe Sports Show. As always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe. Well, Joe, I mean, we've been hearing the rumors for for months. Uh, you know, it was always going to be Lane Kiffin or Hugh Freeze. That seemed to be the way it was presented to us, even though a lot of us vocal members of the Auburn fan base, like myself, wanted Deion Sanders or someone different. Uh, it always seemed like they were going to swing for the fences on Lane Kiffin, and if they struck out, it was going to go to Hugh Freeze. And we can ask a million people a million things about what happened with Auburn and Lane Kiffin, but whatever it is, it was a strikeout. Um, you know, they reported Pete Thamel and ESPN reported that it was a pull of his family at the last second, which I think if you if you look at it, that makes sense. I mean, uh, I think Lane's got a daughter that's a senior in high school. It's kind of hard to uproot a, a senior in high school, especially at a, a high school as nice as Oxford, to get him to move somewhere. Um, I believe his dad, you know, his dad's an older guy, Monty. Uh, Oxford's also a great place to retire, something that makes a lot of sense too. And I think his son is one of the best, uh, you know, young college – I mean, the best young quarterbacks that they have in the state of Mississippi at the age of 13. You know, so there, there's a lot of things that, that make sense right there. Um and, you know, on the converse side, you know, we I've been hearing for years that Hugh Freeze had coveted the Auburn job, that it was one that he really liked. I mean, his daughter graduated from Auburn and apparently works for the main NIL collective they have at Auburn on to victory. So there's a lot of connections there that kind of make sense. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one thing where I feel very conflicted about it. You know, I've been against it for years. <laughs> I didn't want it two years ago when they were talking about hiring him uh, over Harson. Or, uh, you know, I mean, you know Harson kind of came out of nowhere at the end. Um, but it's almost like, I, you know, in my mind, I wish they would have gone ahead and hired him two years ago. Of course, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But, you know, in my mind... I get the reason they did it. I just I hate the look of it. I think, obviously, in this day and age in college football, with the added pressure we have with so much money all over the place, and then with the strength of the SEC West specifically, nothing is guaranteed as far as the success for any coach year in and year out. But I do think that we can come away maybe in a couple of years feeling like this could be a good hire. Um, I feel like it's a good fit from a culture standpoint. Um, I think that it's a much better culture fit than Lane Kiffin because I think Hugh Freeze is going to fit in so much better with uh, the Auburn culture, with the fan base, and I think he's going to say the right things. Um, Hugh Freeze is one of those guys that when you hear him talk, um, it, it can be mesmerizing at times with his recruiting pitch. He's always been an outstanding recruiter. I think at Auburn, he's just going to take that to another level. For me, I think that you know the biggest thing will be can he you know create that separation from eight and four seasons to seasons where you contend for the playoffs, and that's the big uh, question. Yeah, Joe. I mean, you know, I, I was looking at it, and of course, I remember when we were in law school, the kind of recruiting classes he had. I mean, he had the one that finished number three, and then I think he had one that finished number eight, and of course, the the first great class that he had that included five stars, uh, Treadwell, and. Uh, Robert Kendici and Laramie Tunzel, they just kind of shocked everybody. And then the next year, I think, was like a very big-time year for the state of Mississippi for recruits, and he got, I think, like eight of the top 12 players in Mississippi that year. And, you know, he was. He's an excellent recruiter. And I, and I will say this, Joe, I mean, as someone that was against the hire, I watched his opening press conference today, this morning, and it was excellent. I mean, and he really did. I mean, it talks about winning the, you know, winning the press conference. He definitely gets a W there. Um, you know, I feel like he was very, very honest about things. He was contrite. Um, you know, he also, you know, made a good point, which is, who are really you to judge me if my wife and my family forgives me? Then that's what matters. And I think that's that's a very fair point. And you can't argue with the success that he that he had. Uh, and you know, and I feel like. You know, I made this point earlier that he did have a losing record in the SEC, but I feel like the, the last two years at Ole Miss can almost be kind of like forgiven for him because they were ones where you knew the NCAA hammer was coming and everyone was putting a cloud over the program. But when you didn't have that cloud there, it was real steady progression. I mean, it was this first season they won seven games. The second season it was eight games. Third season it was nine games. And it was just going up by one game a year, which, I mean, talk about great incremental, you know, improvement. That's what you want to see as a coach. 
And at Liberty, I mean, you know, until the last three games of the season after he beat Arkansas and everyone was rumoring he was going to Auburn, he was having a great season this year. Of course, in 2020, they lost one game and beat BYU with Malik Williams. Um, he did things I didn't think were imaginable at Liberty. And so, you know, I, I want to believe that he can not get in the same kind of trouble that he had in the past. And, you know, one of those things I kind of feel like is taken care of for him, that NCA part of it, the stuff that, you know, he allegedly did at Ole Miss, that doesn't matter anymore. Now you can just get your collective to do it, which ironically his daughter works for. So, I mean, I feel like from the recruiting standpoint and what he did to get players to Ole Miss, that doesn't matter anymore. It's just whether he's passed, you know, the other stuff, which – I mean, you know, now we're talking, what, six years since all that stuff happened, and we haven't really heard about anything at Liberty. You know, so, I, I mean, I know there was that story about him sending the message, the direct message to the girl that was a part of the sexual assault investigation at Liberty that was one of the um, one of the people that was filing the lawsuit. But that was him defending the athletic director, and he's not involved in that anyway, so I don't really feel like you can say that's actually related. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I think at this point, you know, if John Cohen, who's the AD, who apparently seems to be very, you know, very thorough in what he does, and he went through a lot of checkpoints, if he feels like he's confident with it, then there probably is something to that. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, a couple of things with irony, how ironic is it that you have a former Mississippi State AD, former Ole Miss head coach now working together at Auburn, and then what is it with these former Arkansas State head coaches consecutively – with uh, Auburn. I think that that's really uh, interesting there is kind of a subplot. Um, additionally, building off your point, you know, with the success he had at Ole Miss and the trajectory he was on, yeah, I'm on record saying that if the NCAA had not, you know, did what they did, you look back to 2016 coming off that Sugar Bowl win, the program was on an ascension at Ole Miss, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten wins. The recruiting class that he brought in with Shea Patterson, with A.J. Brown, D.K. Greg Little. Greg Little. You know, right when all the NCAA stuff happened, that's what I believe prevented them from getting recruits like Jeffrey Simmons. Hugh Freeze was bringing in the makings of an SEC championship roster. And he had just, you know, defeated Nick Saban two years in a row, almost beat him three years in a row. You know, he's defeated Kirby Smart on his resume. I mean, he's defeated all the people that Auburn needs to defeat. And he's obviously a thorn in Nick Saban's side. And I got to think that's a huge component with this hiring, too. Joe, I think that's a huge factor that, I mean, outside of Les Miles, he's the only one that's beaten Nick Saban two years in a row since he's been in Alabama. A lot of people forget that in 2010 and 2011, Les Miles beat Nick Saban back to back. But in more recent memory, the only person who's done it is Hugh Freeze in 14 and 15. And the second time they did it, really, you not know, talked about it before. It should have been beat down. They had a, they had Alabama. You know, they didn't step on the throat back then, but they had them for a long time, beating them by a lot in that game. And you know that twenty the, the twenty fourteen team. I mean, there were, and, and the fifteen team had so many close calls from getting to that next level, winning the SEC West, maybe being a college football playoff uh, team. You know, it's interesting that the very first college football playoff included Ole Miss and Auburn and Mississippi State, the very first ranking. It's like, it's hard to believe that, but in 2014, that was the way it was. And that was Hugh Freeze that did that. Wayne Kiffin has never had Ole Miss in the top four of the college football playoff rankings. Uh, you know, that's only been Hugh Freeze that did that. Of course, Matt Luke never even sniffed that. Um I mean, he definitely – he had a great level of success that was going, and, of course, he got sidelined by the NCAA – and I'm sure, you know, if you're a lifelong Ole Miss fan, you would say that the NCAA was quite harsh on Ole Miss when somehow they never did anything to Miami. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had even more information on everything, you know. Um, and, you know, it definitely, definitely is someone that has proven that he can have success in the SEC West. And I will say that you're talking about the fit standpoint. One thing that he had over any other coaching candidate is proven track record in the SEC West. You know, Lane Kiffin and Hugh Freeze is pretty much it in terms of what you're looking at as a realistic candidate that would make people happy that had success in the SEC West. I mean, any other candidate, including someone like if you were to, to Atlanta and Dabo Sweeney or James Franklin, they weren't people that had success in the SEC West. 
And so I think that after what happened with Brian Harson bringing him in from Idaho, uh, him having no experience in the Southeast, you know, taking a little bit of a risk on a hire, the you know the powers that be decided we have to get someone that knows how to recruit, someone that knows how to coach in the SEC West, and he definitely was the one that checked the most boxes there. You know, and uh, also, too, I mean, even with. Jerry there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Even with um, even with uh, with Lane Kiffin, I mean, he still hasn't, you know, he still hasn't beat Nick Saban yet. So that was a huge, that's a huge feather in the cap for Hugh Freeze. And I just think that, you know, after you saw what happened with Harson, they wanted to have the safe bet. And another thing, too, that I think really, you know, resonates with this hire is this is someone that really wants this job. And people have known for a long time he wants it. And you know what? I know there's a lot of fear right now that if you hire someone that does really good, when the Alabama job opens up, maybe there's going to be someone that jumps for it. And I don't think you have to worry about that with Hugh Freeze. So that's another thing that I think is also – is also out there. So I don't know. It makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, uh, I could see how you could put a parallel to maybe someone like a Pat Dye too with Hugh Freeze. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. And, and like I said, you know, nothing's guaranteed. It, it changes so much from year to year. You know, Sam Pittman was the toast of the town last year in Fayetteville. You know, he didn't end this season on a high, high note. You know, you look at um, Blaine Kippen with a little bit of tailspin at the end. But the ironic thing, though, about Lane Kiffin and the Hugh Freeze angle here with Nick Saban is think back, you know, to 2014. One of the reasons I, I hear people talking about today that you go back and think about Nick Saban bringing in Lane Kiffin as an offensive coordinator was to curtail, you know, the offensive prowess and kind of be able to match up with the Hugh Freeze offense at all this. And so now you have, ironically, all three of them competing against each other with uh, Kiffin at Ole Miss now, and then uh, Hugh Freeze at Auburn. That's right, Joe. That's, that is a good point. Uh, you know, definitely three guys have a lot of history together, and that was, I mean, that was when uh, Nick Saban went away from his standard ground-and-pound offense with a game-manager play-action quarterback that he'd had the entire time he had been at, at Alabama that highlighted his defense to a little bit more of a whiskey style with a lot more passing where – you know what, you're willing to give up a little bit of points on your defense, but you know that your offense is going to be that much better than everyone else's and that much revolutionary with Lane Kiffin. So that, that is what started that. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. So, I mean, I, I think ultimately, you know, it could end up being a good hire. I'm really fascinated to see um, how it goes, you know, because it kind of takes me back to the law school days following Hugh Freeze's career and uh, really, you know, always enjoyed, you know, his the style of his team's and want to see, you know, how he does um, at, at Auburn going forward. Yeah, and something else, too, that I think makes me feel better about the hire is that they were able to hold on to Cadillac Williams and upgrade him to assistant head coach. And he definitely earned that. I mean, he did a great job, uh, you know, as the interim head coach for Auburn. He had three games, should have won three of them, and the Alabama game, they were just a lot better than Auburn, and there wasn't much he could do about it. But the, the atmosphere that he created, the excitement he had, just you could see the goodness shining through him as a person and just kind of that, the electricity you brought to the Auburn program. You kind of feel like now that you have a guy that's sitting there, you know, in the secondary level that if something bad happens, you can trust him to, to do with everything. But you also have someone at the head coach level who seems like they want this job. So there's a lot of momentum, I feel like, for Auburn when you combine those two together. And I'm just very happy for Cadillac that he's able to get this promotion and that he's going to stay at Auburn because I really think that he's a good fit there and he did a lot of great things last year. I think so. I, th I think that, you know, that that was good for uh, Hugh Freeze to, to um, you know, have him on the, the staff in that role. And, you know, like I said, I'm really interested to see see how Freeze want to see from a recruiting standpoint if he can, you know, solve that puzzle with consistently for himself personally recruiting linebackers and running backs probably won't be as hard at Auburn, but that was, of course, you know, the one criticism at Ole Miss. Yeah, the back, the running back, it was a big issue at Ole Miss. I mean, you think about him, he missed out on Cam Akers when he was at Ole Miss. 
and mm-hmm. that style of offense, you know, detracted from him. I think we'll see a lot, uh, Joe, on whether he can keep Carnell, I mean, whether he can keep Tank Bigsby there for another year. He's got Jark West Hunter coming back for another year, so that's a solid running back. But if he can bring back Tank for a senior year and have a, a senior Tank Bigsby and a junior Jark West Hunter to go with what he has, that would be a huge recruiting win right there in and of itself. I think so. I think so. Yeah, so, I mean, and one thing, too, is if he can make a big recruiting, uh, you know, uh, push the next few weeks, this is the best class of players they've had in the state of Alabama in a really long time. And that was one of the huge things that people were getting mad at Horson about is that of the top 15 players in the state of Alabama, all of which are four or five stars, Horson only had one committed. That was a very good running back called out of uh, Montgomery Catholic, but that's the only one he had. And so now you got Hugh Freeze and Peter with Catalonic, a little bit of time, maybe Auburn get a couple of those guys before signing day and take what was going to be just an awful class and maybe turn it into an okay one. Right. No, absolutely. And then the last thing I'll say, like I said, you know, with the caveat, once again, you never know what's going to happen. But I look at the schedule next year, Alabama, Georgia, and Ole Miss heading to Auburn for Hugh Freeze. I gu- I'm not saying they're going to win all those games or any of those games guaranteed, but I guarantee you they'll be really entertaining with Hugh Freeze. I, there's no doubt about that. There, there's going to be a constant eye on Auburn, and you know they made the big move, and we'll see if it works out. And Joe, someone that also made a big move and a hire that I couldn't believe in a little bit similar situation to Auburn. Um, you know, of course, this coach in Canada doesn't come with any of the kind of baggage that Hugh Freeze does, but there was an internal candidate that people loved, uh, Jim Leonard in Wisconsin. I mean, this was. He was the guy that was the chosen heir. I mean, he had such great defenses at Wisconsin. It kind of seemed like people have been talking about him being the next head coach at Wisconsin for, what, Joe, four or five years? People have been talking about it. He gets this chance to be the interim head coach at Wisconsin. And he doesn't do a terrible job, but it's kind of okay. And, you know, all the fans want him. All the players want him. But they go out and they catch a big fish in Luke Fickle. And I'm highly impressed, and I've never seen Wisconsin hiring a coach like this before. Yeah, no, that that was really interesting because I never really thought about Fickle going to Wisconsin. Always thought of him, you know, one day being like an Ohio State candidate to go back there or Notre Dame, you know, if it doesn't work out with Marcus Allen. I I just never really thought of Wisconsin. You You don't see that in Wisconsin's pedigree to kind of go outside the box like that that much. And also, Luke Fickle, you know, was on the hot board. If Ole Miss had an opening, he was going to be like the number one target or number two that they were going to contact first. It's kind of a whirlwind there, but really interesting to see how it works out at Wisconsin. I am too, Joe. I mean, you can't argue with what this guy has done at Cincinnati. He's done an excellent job. Um, and you're talking about even you go back to when he was an interim head coach at Ohio State. He was an excellent interim when Jim Trestle got fired at, uh, at Ohio State. And – you know, I think we're a huge coup for Wisconsin, and I'm sure there's going to be some hurt feelings about Jim Leonard not getting that job, but if I was a Wisconsin Badger fan and you told me I could have Luke Fickle, I would be over the moon right now about that hire. Yeah, he's got a lot of experience. He's still just 50 years old. Like, it feels like he's been around forever, but he's got you know a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of energy. And, yeah, and, and also, I'm sure there's some Cincinnati fans that are upset, but what you can look at is – he got you to the college football playoff, and he got you into the Big 12. And so you were much better than when he came in. And I feel like you can't have any uh, real upsetness if you're a Cincinnati fan because Wisconsin's always been a little bit of a sleeping giant. You know, they're a program that's been consistently good for a long time. We feel like they've never gone out there and, and made the splash high or had someone that really was that great of a recruiter. They've just kind of followed that same mold for, for such a long time. I think this is going to really inject some life in this program. And you think about the fact that there's about to be a 12-team playoff and the fact that the Big Ten, their side of the Big Ten has been so terrible. I mean, this is just there for the taking for Wisconsin to make themselves a perennial playoff contender. And then their side of the Big Ten also got you know more interesting with uh, Nebraska and Matt Rule. Yeah, that's a great hire too, Joe. I mean, we talked about winning the press conference in the splash hire. Well, the Bills did it five years ago when they hired Scott Frost. I mean, you and I on the show both said, like, wow, like, thumbs up, incredible hire. You know, it's a homegrown home hero. It's the guy that won the national championship for you as a player. Guy who's from Lincoln, Nebraska. 
uh, who took UCF and won, you know, whatever kind of, you can say, Mythical National Championship with, you know, with 20 years. But the point is, he went in the field and they beat a really good Auburn team at the end of that year. Whatever you want to say about a nat- winning a national championship. But that didn't work out. What you're bringing in in that rule is a guy that is a program revitalizer, someone who takes programs when they're their lowest moments and makes them good. Uh, Temple had been in the doldrums for a while. He comes in, they you know, they improve a little bit, but he put them on the national scene as not a basketball school, but a football school. He comes in and bathing after all of the art brothers, and he takes them to uh he takes them to a sugar bowl, uh, where they win. I, mean, I think they were lost to Georgia, but they were close with them. He took them to a big twelve championship where they just about beat Jalen Hurts in Oklahoma. That was a very close game. And then he parlayed that into an opportunity with the Carolina Panthers, which didn't work out. But as a college coach, and especially as a college coach in kind of that Western area, uh, when you look at what he did at Baylor, he's an excellent football coach. And I thought this was a slam dunk hire for Nebraska. I think so. I mean, if it, if it doesn't work out with him, it's just not meant to work out, I think, unfortunately, for Nebraska. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's it's a good hire. Uh, and to me, he strikes me as one of those coaches that is just a better college coach than NFL. I think he is too. And, and you know, I mean, that Matt Williams, he was mentioned a little bit in, in the Auburn head coaching search. I don't think that would have been a good fit for him, though. I think that he kind of needs a place where the recruiting isn't as scary. You know, he's not going against the Kobe Smarts and, and the Nick Sabins because I've kind of always heard that he's more of an X's and O's guys and a program builder in terms of like the internal side of it versus someone that's a recruiter. And I feel like Auburn might have not really worked out for him. And he still would be a little bit of an outsider there. But I feel like in Nebraska, it's a place that, A, it's kind of hard to recruit you. And I feel like you have to be more on the X's and O's side of it. And I also think that what you've seen with him taking these programs that are down in the doldrums and bringing them up, it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and the the schedule that they play lends itself to kind of being able to start year one on training wheels a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we look at what's going on with the the Big Ten right now, their division of it. I mean, Wisconsin's down right now. They they just hunted Blue Fickle, but they've had a rough year. Iowa's down this year. I'm really looking at a team that's representing their side of the Big Ten and Purdue that has three losses, Joe. So you come in there to Nebraska, there's not a, like a huge hill to climb for you to beat in the Big Ten championship game. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, three really fascinating hires. And I do also want to say, Joe, that I think there was a, a big period for two lane to hold on to really fits. Apparently, Georgia Tech was all bored on getting really fast to go from Tulane to Georgia Tech. And they're Tulane now, they're, they're in the AAC. Uh, they've been getting a lot more pop lately. They had a really good season. And I think for them to hold on to really Fritz is great and maybe tells you something about what the way, you know, maybe they view themselves as a team that can maybe make a 12 team playoff at some point as one of those AAC teams. Mm-hmm. And also think when you have these coaches that are playing in conference championship games, you sometimes have the team, you know, that's wanting to make the move. They can get a little bit impatient, I think, with wanting to, with recruiting deadlines, the transfer portal. They want to move quick. He wants to coach, you know, the championship game undoubtedly. And so I do think that probably played a factor here too. That's right, Jim. And we also got two former players that are making a lot of news. It's guys that don't have a whole lot of new coaching experience. Uh, you know, being one of the big jobs are landed on. Um, I wanted to ask you first, what do you think about Trent Dilfer getting the UAB job? I mean, I think it's really interesting in the sense that, you know, he was always a guy that I always enjoyed uh, him as an analyst uh, with the NFL on ESPN. Um, you know, he's a guy, obviously, that uh, won a Super Bowl, you know, faced criticism as far as, you know, being one of the most underwhelming starting quarterbacks to win a Super Bowl. But there's just something about him. I feel like he's a, a very eloquent guy, a great motivator, and uh, really interested to see what he does with this team. Also, yes, I remember the, the kind of the quarterback analysis that he would have was the best that anyone's I've ever seen on ESPN. Like every time they had a new quarterback coming in, he had a quarterback that came up in the interview and they got into the analytics of it. And I just came to me thinking he was maybe the best knowledgeable person they had on ESPN when it came to that. I always thought of him as the worst quarterback to ever win a Super Bowl. But it seemed like the kind of perfect person to be a head coach, someone that was such a that was really bad, like you know, NFL quarterback, but was able to win a Super Bowl and like work with his great defense. It seems like it kind of makes sense for someone that's going to be a good head coach. 
Yeah, it sounds like he would be really good, like, as a, as a teacher, a motivator, and just, like, really explaining things. Absolutely. And, Joe, on the flip side of it, we have Deion Sanders, who was the one that, you know, I, I wanted him for Auburn just because I knew what his recruiting prowess is. We saw it with Jackson State, him bringing in Travis Hunter, the number one player in the country, and what he's done to really revitalize a, a program that had some highs in the 80s in Jackson State, but since then it's been a little bit of an afterthought. Um, he finally got a Power 5 offer, Joe, from Colorado, which I, I know you're doing one of the best Power 5 programs right now, but you don't have enough like me to remember a time in the late 80s and early 2000s when Colorado was, they were a top 5 program in all of college football. They were great. The, the Colorado-Nebraska game was one of the biggest games of the year every year, and they're a program that has a lot of things going for it right now. I mean, Boulder is a beautiful city. I loved that campus. I remember when I was a little kid and I went and visited Boulder, I thought it was the coolest place I'd ever seen. And even their stadium's kind of cool. It's not huge, but you're walking on the main street, you're looking down in a bowl, and there's the stadium down there below you, and you have the mountains all around. And I think it's kind of a cool environment. And Dion took this offer, and instead of you know keeping it to himself or considering his options, let everyone know that he got this job essentially, you know, I guess saying that I've got this offer, so everyone else should offer me too. But to me, that just seems really disrespectful, Jay. And I feel like I think it's going to backfire on him a little bit. Well, you know, we'll wait and see after uh, this weekend with uh, the Jackson State game, you know, for sure what he does. I know, you know, there was also some traction with uh, USF as well. Yeah, I would be fascinated to see him take the job at Colorado. Uh, I think a lot of people would. Um, you know, suddenly Colorado would go from one and eleven to like arguably one of the most fascinating teams in the country. I feel. I mean, in my mind, like if you're not getting the other offers, why not throw it out and throw shade on it? Take that job, do it for a couple of years, and maybe you get a big job. Hey, no, Tucker did it for one year and got that Michigan State job, and you know, you saw what happened there with him getting that cushy, you know, deal that Nick would say, including myself, was not deserved. <laughs> So, I mean, it, I just don't understand why he did that because I could see Colorado being a really great job in and of itself or at the very least being a better stepping stone than Jackson State is. Yeah, yeah, you, you feel like he's got to go, you know, to another program before he gets like that, you know, big-time power five. Yeah, I thought that was a good opportunity. I thought Georgia Tech and Colorado both kind of fit that mold of programs that have won national championships in the past, do have a lot of potential, but if you find them to be too difficult to win at in the current landscape, are ones where you can have some good success and parlay that into one of the big jobs to getting an Auburn, a Florida State, an Alabama, whatever it is, you know, you can maybe do well, it. I will say this. I, I don't know if it'll be Deion Sanders, but I do get the sense that Colorado is waiting for the conclusion of championship weekend to make their hire which makes me think if it's not Deion Sanders, it's somebody that's on a staff that's still playing, whether it's a coordinator or head coach somewhere. I think that they're waiting for that reason. Uh, I think so too. And, you know, like I said, I think that's a job that has definitely, you know, taken a dive of it, but it's still one that has a lot of potential. Right, right. And when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, all of the great things that happened in, in Wild Bowl weekend. Um, really, really tight games and big upsets, including uh, South Carolina over Clemson. And then we're going to get into uh, Championship Weekend and do a preview of a Championship Weekend that's taken a little bit of a you know downhill turn in terms of the excitement of it, but which has brought up an opportunity for some new blood in the college football playoff. Uh, you can catch all the episodes on Spotify. Just look up the Dan and Joe Sports Show on Spotify. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Dan and Joe Sports Show YouTube channel, and you can also follow us on Twitter at DJ Sports Show or like our Facebook fan page. And as always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe.